March attack had failed. The April attack had failed. By May the 1st, 1918, Germany's situation was already becoming dangerous. Hindenburg and Ludendorff had thrown the whole available strength of the German army against the British. Everything that Germany possessed had been flung in. The British had lost 240,000 men in 40 days. The French, coming to their aid, had lost over 100,000. But the Germans themselves had lost nearly 350,000 men. Germany's failure went deeper than the great loss of men, tragic as this was for her war-weary people and soldiers. She had also lost the 40 days, and time was more precious to her now than ever before. Field Marshal Hindenburg expressed the German problem. We had a new enemy, economically the most powerful in the world, an enemy possessing everything required for the hostile operations, reviving the hopes of all our foes and saving them from collapse while preparing mighty forces. It was the United States of America and her advent was perilously near. Would she appear in time to snatch the victor's laurels from our brows? That and that only was the decisive question. Nearly 13 months had passed since America had entered the war. During those months, her allies had each endured their severest ordeals. Russia had fallen. France had sunk to her lowest depths of weariness. Italy had trembled on the edge of catastrophe. Britain had faced defeat by starvation at the hands of the U-boats. Yet in their darkest hours, the Allies had drawn hope from one thought. The Americans would be coming. Someday, sooner or later. As the weeks turned into months, and the months completed a year, the sour truth emerged that it would be later. Despite her vast resources, America's unpreparedness for war exceeded that of any other country. The British Prime Minister, Lloyd George, commented, The record of Britain's first ten months of blundering in the matter of equipment robs us of the right to point the finger of scorn at America's effort. But it must be remembered that when America entered into the struggle, her industry was already largely organized for war by the immense Allied orders for war material of every kind. Delay followed delay. Delay in production, delay in organization, delay even in clothing America's new army. All adding up to the worst delay of all. The delay in arriving on the field of battle. As the British awaited the first great German onslaught in March, the historian F.S. Oliver remarked, it's a question of holding out until the Americans come in. Until the Americans come in? God damn them, are they ever coming in with all their boastful, vainglorious talk? The March battles were fought without benefit of American support. So were the battles of April. Now it was May. On the 2nd, Oliver was asking, when is it reasonable to think that the Americans will be able to put in that immense army of three millions, fully equipped, each man with a hair mattress, a hot water bottle, a gramophone and a medicine chest, which they tell us will get to Berlin and cook the goose of the Kaiser? When? If it came next year, it might produce the desired military results, but is there the slightest reason to imagine that it will come next year, or the year after, or even the year after that? From a purely military point of view, I don't see victory approaching. American energy was enormous. American enthusiasm for the war was undoubted. All the ebullience of a youthful nation poured into this effort.
On May the 1st, 1918, there were only 400,000 Americans in France. There was only one American division on an active front, only four divisions in the line altogether. Sickening for the Allies, the frustrations of the long wait were sickening for Americans too. American soldiers arriving in France were disgusted to find that they depended on their allies for even the simplest munitions of war. The British supplied helmets, clothing, transport, heavy artillery, tanks. The French supplied the vast numbers of field guns needed, aircraft, even machine guns. A shipment of machine guns finally arrived. And when we opened them, we almost had a revolution. We found, we received Hotchkiss guns, Hotchkiss machine guns. That was the guns the French army used. Well, there was a big commotion. The officers got in touch with the headquarters and headquarters with the Supreme Headquarters and back and forth, back and forth, but nothing happened. Next morning, the officer came in and said, man, I'm sorry, that's it. Those are your weapons and that's what you will have to use up front. You better learn how to operate them. Too sweet. <laughs> Training, drilling, marching, practicing, more training, still more training. French instructors, British instructors, whatever else they were, the Americans were not idle. And so, uh, we were trained, and we were trained right down to the bone. We awaited the call. We were no uh, jingos or we were no uh, uh, screamers around for this or that, but we were trained for war. That was our profession, the regular Marines. And uh, uh, we didn't like the waiting behind the line. We practically broke open a bottle of champagne when the word came that we were to move the uh, next 48 hours somewhere. We didn't care where. Uh, we'd had enough of this uh, business of play acting. Uh, we wanted to get somewhere where we could do some damage and uh, get done, get back home. The first weeks of May passed quietly on the Western Front, but it was a spurious calm. While the Americans completed their training and organization and absorbed over 200,000 newcomers in France, the Allies licked their wounds. Every British division was below strength. 10 out of 40 were so weakened that they were described as exhausted and scheduled to be broken up. Reinforcements consisted mostly of boys of 18 and a half, or wounded men returning to the ranks. Old soldiers found it an ugly task to prepare boys fresh from school or apprenticeship for the hardest battlefields ever known. When they came to us, they were weedy, sallow, skinny, frightened children refuse of our industrial system as it was in those days and they were in very poor condition because of wartime shortages of food but after six months of good food fresh air and physical exercise they changed so that their mothers wouldn't have recognized them we weighed and measured them and they put on an average of one stone in weight and one inch in height Frenchmen found it difficult to sympathize with British manpower problems France herself had sacrificed steadily throughout the war the best of her manhood. By April 1918, she was already calling on the conscripts of 1919 to avoid breaking up divisions. The Allied Commander-in-Chief, General Foch, protested to Field Marshal Haig. Foch is very anxious that no divisions should be reduced. He's sure that out of the 1,400,000 men wearing khaki in England, 100,000 could be obtained to fill out our divisions sufficiently to hold a quiet part of the front and release French divisions for the general reserve. The French Prime Minister took the matter up officially with the British government. Reluctantly, Lloyd George released more men to fill the wasted ranks. <laughs> Haig 
Falling in with Foshi's plan, dispatched five of his weakest divisions to recuperate on a quiet French sector, the Chemin des Dames, along the river Aisne. To battered, battle-weary troops, whose only knowledge of France was based upon their experience of the northern front, the Champagne country, in the full glory of spring, was a revelation. Here, all was peace. The countryside basked contentedly in the blazing sunshine. Trim villages nestled in quiet hollows beside lazy streams. And tired eyes were refreshed by the sight of rolling hills clad with great woods, golden with laburnum blossom. Here, among the vineyards, where the French peasants were at work within two miles of the front line, the British soldiers rested. But their brief holiday was soon over, for it was precisely here, by one of the war's most bitter ironies, that the next German blow was being prepared. Ludendorff's plan was simple. He meant to continue as he had begun, by smashing the main British armies. But first it would be necessary to draw away the French reserves which had gone to the British front. To do this, he would have to attack the French. The Germans transported their divisions and assembled their artillery opposite the Chemin des Dames in deep secrecy. The short weeks of calm passed by. General Foch asked himself, What was hidden behind this silence? We knew that the enemy had large numbers of troops at his disposal. Where would they suddenly appear? We searched the horizon, but the mystery remained unsolved. Not until a few hours before the German attack were the Allied soldiers warned. The first news reached us about 3.45 p.m. on May the 26th. The enemy will attack on a wide front at 0100 hours tomorrow, 27th inst. Then followed orders for taking up battle station. For a second we looked at each other in silence. In a flash the whole world had changed. The landscape around us smiled no longer. The sun still blazed down, but it had lost its heat. For the first time in the war, I had the feeling that there was no one behind us, no help which could be relied upon in case of need. The blow fell at 1 a.m. on May the 27th. The weak British divisions were right in its path. In overwhelming strength, the Germans swept across the Chemin des Dames ridge and over the Aisne. By evening, they had advanced ten miles. Nothing like it had ever been seen on the Western Front. On the second day, May the 28th, they pressed forward another five miles. On this day, further to the west, an omen of a different kind appeared. The American 1st Division went into action at the little town of Cantigny. I was watching through binoculars and they had a creeping barrage that was slowly creeping towards the town of Cantigny, which was situated on high ground. I could see some of the waves of American soldiers as they, as they went forward. I saw many of them fall. I saw some of them uh, get up and follow the barrage again. Americans took Cantigny, their first victory of the war. But more than this was needed to stop the great German advance on the Aisne. And something more was forthcoming. As the Germans swept towards the river Marne, reviving all the memories and fears of 1914, a wonderful spectacle was seen by the anxious French. Swarms of Americans began to appear on the roads. They passed in interminable columns. 
the spectacle of these magnificent youths from overseas, these beardless children of 20, radiating strength and health, produced a great effect. They contrasted strikingly with our regiments in their faded uniforms, wasted by so many years of war, whose members, thin, their sunken eyes shining with a dull fire, were no more than bundles of nerves held together by a will to heroism and sacrifice. We all had the impression that we were about to see a wonderful operation of transfusion of blood. It was June the 1st when the Americans entered this fight near Chateau Thierry, another name from the past, a landmark of 1914. By June the 3rd, the Germans were halted. They were 56 miles from Paris. At every level, a dangerous mood displayed itself. French peasants spat on the remnants of British units retreating from the Aisne. The British retorted bitterly. At this period, the conviction was growing among the rank and file that we were fighting on the wrong side. A conviction I'd heard expressed many times since 1917, but never before with such feeling. Sharp words were exchanged when the Allied leaders met at Versailles on June the 2nd. Now it was the turn of the French generals to find themselves under the cloud of defeat, as the British had been in March and April. Even the prestige of General Foch was shaken. Foch rounded upon the British Prime Minister, Mr Lloyd George, with new demands that the British army should be brought up to strength. The argument raged for two hours. The French insisted on sending an expert to investigate British manpower. Lloyd George had to agree. Yet the British and French were united on one subject. America must send more men and send them fast. All eyes turned upon General John J. Pershing, the American commander-in-chief. Pershing had his own views of the part America must play in the war. He had made them quite clear from the moment of his taking command. I was decidedly against our becoming a recruiting agency for either the French or British. While fully realizing the difficulties, it was definitely understood that we should proceed to organize our own units from top to bottom and build a distinctive army of our own as rapidly as possible. In America, the camps and depots filled. There was a great gathering of men. But the difficulties of making a new United States Army had proved to be beyond anyone's imagining. It was unthinkable that the young, proud American nation should consent to send her soldiers to fight under other flags. As the crises of 1918 developed, the Allies put every pressure on Pershing to change or moderate his plan. But Pershing was made of stubborn stuff. At a crucial meeting in May, General Foch had said, are you willing to risk our being driven back to the Loire? Pershing retorted, Yes, I'm willing to take the risk. Ludendorff's arguments on the field of battle proved to be more powerful than the pleas of the Allied leaders round the table. With the Germans across the Marne again, Pershing was forced to compromise. He cabled to Washington, Consider military situation very grave. It should be most fully realized at home that the time has come for us to take up the brunt of the war, and that England and France are not going to be able to keep their armies at present strength very much longer. Pershing agreed that 250,000 Americans should be brought to France in June, and another quarter of a million in July. He agreed that absolute priority should be given to infantry, without supporting arms, trained or untrained, just men. Britain would find the shipping. 56% of these men were carried in British ships. A blood transfusion on a scale never dreamt of now began.
Pershing gained one point. The Americans were, after all, fighting in divisions under their own command. And while the Allied leaders wrangled, American soldiers entered their grimmest experience so far. On June the 6th, the American 2nd Division, half of it Marines, attacked at Belle Eau Wood. Uh, we got into the edge of the woods and uh, we dug in and we took position there. But the difficulty with Belle Eau Wood was you never knew where the front was. Little groups of uh, men, little uh, of Americans, little groups of Germans got together to fight each other. And while you were fighting in one direction, all of a sudden, without any warning, you would find that there were some Germans to the rear of you, and they had to be mopped up. Clean up, mop up, and move ahead, move ahead. open order and in mass, the Americans lost heavily at Bellow Wood, but they were not to be denied. As their first wounded came back, khaki figures among the blue of the Frenchmen, a French nurse said to one of them, surely you're an American. He replied, no ma'am, I'm a Marine. There were three American divisions in battle now and infinite promise behind them. But still, it was German plans which would decide where and how the next battle would be fought. It was not an easy decision. A German commander wrote, Our casualties were increasing alarmingly. Ammunition was running short, and the problem of supply became more and more difficult. It became all too clear that action so stubbornly contested would never enable us to capture Paris. In truth, the brilliant offensive had petered out. What should the Germans do? Ludendorff, planner and organizer of their great offensives, was in a cruel dilemma. His main intention was still to attack the British front. But meanwhile, there was the temptation of repeating a crushing blow against the French army. Ludendorff became entangled in his own web. He temporized. The temptation was too strong. He decided to attack the French again. The first day's advance on June the 9th was six miles deep and the Germans took 8,000 prisoners. The next day they advanced another two miles. And then stopped. On June the 11th the French struck back. American divisions formed the spearhead of their attack, supported by nearly 150 tanks and by low-flying aircraft. bright swords, no lines of battle charging with a yell. Combat groups of weary men in drab and dirty uniforms, dressed approximately on a line, spaced so that one shrapnel burst cannot include more than one group. Laden like mules with gas masks, bandoliers, grenades, trudging forward without haste and without excitement. They moved on an untidy wood where shells were a wood that did not answer back or show an enemy. The French attack did not go far, but it did its work. The Germans were halted, 
and Ludendorff surveyed the results of another precious month that had gone by without producing victory. At the moment, there might be 20 American divisions in France in all, more than I had believed possible. And not only had our march superiority and the numbers of divisions been cancelled, but even the difference in gross numbers was now to our disadvantage. It was for this reason that America became the deciding factor in the war. Now, once again, there was a brief period of calm on the Western Front. Fighting died down into local actions. Everywhere, commanders and soldiers drew breath and took stock of their position. Like a ripple across the calm, or a breath of fresh wind, an idea stirred among the Allied leaders. General Foch recorded, I did not lose sight of the offensive task for which the Allied armies must at once get ready which ought to be undertaken as soon as possible, since it was only by offensive action that they could bring the war to a victorious conclusion. On June the 28th, Foch met Haig, who wrote in his diary, I told Foch of two small offensive projects which I contemplated carrying out, if the military situation allowed. He was pleased at my holding offensive intentions at the present time. The British Army had profited by its period of rest. Spirits had revived. The ranks were filling. Our troops are really wonderful, Haig commented. One part of his army had never accepted defeat in any form or submitted to enemy initiative. On April the 25th, the third anniversary of Anzac Day, the Australians had counterattacked at Villers Bretonneux, Villers Brett, marking the high water line of the German advance towards Amiens. Through May and June, the Australian front was fluid and active. It was the Australians whom Haig had designated for one of his offensive projects now, at Le Amel, another example of what they themselves called peaceful penetration. And with the Australians, there would be men of the American 33rd Division. Haig had a high opinion of the Americans, who had paraded for his inspection only a few days before. I was much impressed. They are a fine body of men, keen, active, and athletic looking. The date selected for the Le Amel project was appropriate. July the 4th, Independence Day. But at the last moment, there was an unexpected snag. General Pershing was appalled to find that his soldiers, whom he considered to be untrained, had been given definite tasks in the Australian battle plan. Pershing announced that the Americans must be withdrawn. Haig had to agree and informed his army commander, Rawlinson, who passed on the news to the Australian commander, General Monash. Monash had once demanded to see Rawlinson. It was a meeting full of tense situations. I well knew that the withdrawal of those Americans would result in untold confusion and in dangerous gaps in our line of battle. So I resolved to take a firm stand and press my views as strongly as I dared. In effect, Monash told Rawlinson, no Americans, no battle. Rawlinson spoke again to Haig, who gave his authority to use American troops. Monash remarked, it appeared to me at the time that great issues had hung for an hour or so upon the chances of my being able to carry my point. Great issues had hung indeed. The battle that followed was a model for the whole war. It was all over in an hour and a half. of some 750 Australians, a 
and 130 Americans, 1,500 Germans were captured, and all the ground attacked had been won. Monash commented, Le Hamel was the first offensive operation on any substantial scale that had been fought by any of the Allies since the previous autumn. Its effect was electric, and it stimulated many men to the realization that the enemy was, after all, not invulnerable. And now the war turned into a race. Both Foch and Ludendorff were pushing forward their preparations for attack. For the Germans, it was a matter, in Ludendorff's words, of striking one more blow that should make the enemy ready for peace. There was no other way. General headquarters again decided to attack the enemy at his weak point. Accordingly, an attack on both sides of Reims was planned for the middle of July. Foch perceived that this was the decisive moment of the year and of the war. By the middle of July, it could be seen that the time was fast approaching when the opposing forces would be practically equal. If the enemy did not attack, the hour had come for us to take the offensive. If he did attack, to accompany our parry with a powerful counterstroke. Once again, it was the Germans who completed their preparations first. The German blow fell on July the 15th. A massive attack by 52 divisions, east and west of Reims. Against them, Foch deployed a truly allied army, French, British, Italians and Americans. The Western attack fell upon the Italians and had considerable success. British divisions were rushed up to hold the line. Not far away, the Americans were again called on to make a stern defense. Eastern attack failed completely. Here, the French had deliberately withdrawn from their forward zone, saving their strength for the counter-offensive. A German officer wrote, I have lived through the most disheartening day of the whole war. This wilderness of chalk is not very big, but it seems endless when one gets held up in it. And we are held up. Our guns bombarded empty trenches, our gas shells gassed empty artillery positions. Only in little hidden folds of the ground, sparsely distributed, lay machine gun posts, like lice in the seams and folds of a garment, to give the attacking force a warm reception. After uninterrupted fighting from five o'clock in the morning until the night, we only succeeded in advancing about three kilometers. day the Germans could only make very slight progress. The day after, none at all. The same man wrote, I know that we are finished. My thoughts oppress me. Everything seems to be at a standstill. I do not believe that we shall ever get our hands free again. The American army is there, a million strong. That is too much. The second battle of the Marne, like the first, marked a moment of equilibrium. Now Foch, like Joffre before him, knew that his hour had come. He greeted it with stern satisfaction. On July 17th, the Germans had been reduced to impotence. On the 18th, 
the guns of the Allies were in turn to make their thunder heard at the time and place which had been fixed upon. Once again, as in 1914, all the war, all its potential, all its hopes and fears and deceitful promises were centered on the River Mound. The wheel had come full circle. Thank you.